My name's Mike Solson. I grew up in downtown Brooklyn, uh, which is Cobble Hill now. It used to be it used to be Red Hook. I was in a lot of trouble. It was either go to a boy's home <laughs> during that time. Either you go to a boy's home or you went into the military. And what branch of service did you Marine go? Corps. I didn't know there was another branch, so that's why I have to. We were walking a patrol. Uh, we had to clear a pathway for a chaplain that was going to say mass. And we got to the final hill. We turned around. It took a couple of steps, and then all hell broke loose. You know, they say it was a command detonated mine, but we were also in the middle of an ambush. So we, I never figured out whether the ambush started off, command detonated mine set off the ambush, or but yeah. I was in Da Nang for about, I think for about 15 days. And then I went to Guam where my legs were amputated. And then from Guam, I spent nine months in the Philadelphia Naval Hospital. When I talk about being in the hospital for nine months, you know, I often get a response from guys that have worse injuries of today's war that they healed much quicker, maybe because they were a better man. No, I walked with wooden legs. Hey, today, the legs are so super light and flexible. I, I, when I started walking with artificial legs, I was one of the first group of veterans, amputees, that used a hydraulic ankle, no, a flexible ankle, and a hydraulic knee, which meant the, the ankle actually bent. So that was, oh my God, that was like, that was great, and you, you know, and then we were coming up uh, in the development of legs that stood on by suction. It was sort of like on the theory, you know, when you put your finger in a Coke bottle, once you, one, and if you have a hole and you seal that hole with a screw, you know, you're not going to be able to pull it out, you know, and they applied that same process yeah. to putting on a leg. You get, they had a little screw, you put your, your stump in there, you screwed it, and it would let air out, but wouldn't let air in. Yeah. The hospital that I went to was a great hospital. It was a Philadelphia Naval Hospital. There were good guys, great doctors, and I'm sure, I mean, you really have to look. They weren't prepared for war. Who is? You know, we, we, you have to look at their side. A corpsman's 21 years old. They bring in this guy that, had, that has... He's shot up all over the place. He's bleeding out of every hole in his body, you know? They're scratching their head too, saying, what the hell am I gonna do, you know? But I do remember one thing, I do remember a surgeon. This was back when you could smoke in the hospital room. I remember a surgeon looking over me with a cigar in his mouth. That was the coolest thing. But he did take care of me. Could he have done better? Who knows? My whole thing was to get back, and I think a lot of veterans, was to get back into society. I partied a lot. I had my own parade for seven years, five years. Then somebody told me about school, so I went back to school. The reality of it was, was that I had to be a fool and not to go back to school. They were going to pay my tuition and they were going to give me a stipend. So. How could I lose, you know? And there was a lot of girls and a lot of partying, a lot of, so I had to be a complete idiot not to go, you know? So I went back to school. It introduced me into the arts where I got involved in writing. And from there, I won a couple of awards. And then from the awards, I worked professionally. And I went to the Kennedy Center. You know, I've had like 23 plays produced. Yeah, so I was work. I was out there all the time. Awesome. Well, I'm a service officer. Service officer for what group? Uh, for the, well, for the Marine Corps. I'm certified by the VFW, but by the Marine Corps League, Detachment 246. And this is great. Let me tell you something. There is a difference between Marine service officers and other, any other branch, because I've seen it. Marine or service officers, just go in there, get the job done. I don't care. Only time you call me is if you get arrested. Just as a Marine, you know, your duty is to help everyone. So I take that seriously as being 
a service officer. If you need a job done, you call me, I go in and I do it. That's, I don't care whether it's Army, Navy, Marine Corps. I mean Army, Navy, Air Force, Navy. And I work out of the Marine Corps League, you know, here on Staten Island, which is a great place. The VA would change so much if they would learn how to be kinder. You can keep everything you got, but listen to the veteran, a little bit more compassion. I can walk in there with a broken arm and you ask me, do you smoke? Stop it, all right? Let's stop, everything is tied into smoking. How about me spending a year in Vietnam in, in Agent Orange or drinking water from Camp Lejeune by the gallons? That's of no concern. But the fact that I light up a cigarette that's it. All my all my physical conditions are knock it off, fellas. You know, Mike. Uh, I get are, nuts. You, are you proud of your service? Oh, absolutely. Very proud of being a Marine. Yeah, very proud. It, it was a time that I didn't embrace what it was. But then after years, you know, I realized the difference between a Marine and anyone else. You know, we do God's dirty work, and God does believe. There are some people down here on earth that need to be slapped around, but he's above that, so he calls us. <laughs> you work for the greater good as a Marine. Everybody else will swear by it that they do it, but as a Marine, you are committed to it. That is your life. That's your total embracement. Everything from uh, inviting extra people over to your house for dinner, uh, to emptying your wallet to help somebody. Our veterans, in my eye, is ground zero of what our nation is. If we could heal our veteran community, then we can heal our nation. You know, and it's very important that we, you know, we roll up our sleeves. We're not gonna lose by helping a veteran. And if the guy screws you, beat the shit out of him. What could I say, you know? He, he's ruining it for everyone else. Some, if there's a veteran and he needs help, yeah, you go out and you extend yourself. What type of children are we raising um, when you teach them? See that guy over there? He put his name on the dotted line. He's ready to give his life for you. Well, fuck him. We'll take his parking spot. <laughs> Don't worry. He'll find another way. You know? You know, I know you ordered your soda 20 minutes ago. You're just going to have to wait. That's all, you know? No, it don't work like that. You know, these are guys that really, whether they got called to see combat or not, is not wasn't their choice. You know, as a matter of fact, I've seen more people that, more stressful situations of people that spent eight, nine years waiting to go into combat. They're like they're like destroyed. They feel like they spent eight, nine years waiting for that moment and they would, you know, this whole thing, why wasn't I good enough? Am I being punished? Am I, you know, then living with the guilt of their, you know, of guys that pass, their friends passing, it's a horrible thing. You know, at least me, you see me in a wheelchair, you know, you say, oh, the guy, you know, I'm like the Dalai Lama of, uh, you know, of the disabled, look at him, you know, oh, he's in the wheelchair, he comes back. Hey, I get a check, I got a great wife, a house, you know, I'm doing okay. You know, it's these guys that uh, you don't see their scars that need the help.